Uh, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Ivan. I am the CEO and founder here at datasore.ai. The topic for today will be all AI models are not created equal, and that's a good thing. We're going to be focusing on uh, the world of foundation models, uh, specifically as they relate to natural language processing, text documents, and audio. Uh, a little bit about us before we begin. So Datasor uh, has, is a startup of uh, five years. We offer both an NLP labeling product as well as a private LLM development platform uh, that allows you to compare and build with over 200 of these models. And so that's the experience that we're bringing into today's webinar to talk about the pros and cons um, of this competitive uh, model ecosystem. I myself am a second time founder. I've built AI solutions previously at, uh, at my companies, uh, Apple and Yahoo, and um, Datasort itself is a graduate of both Stardex, uh, Stanford Stardex, as well as y, y Combinator. Um, and we have spent the last five years uh, working with and collaborating with Fortune 500 companies from across the globe, uh, researchers and academics, um, as well as the uh, public sector to help bring NLP solutions to these organizations. Okay, so uh, the most common question I get uh, by far is what is the best model? Data scientists uh, spending you know, all day in this space are still overwhelmed by this explosion of model options. Right. Um, it's very difficult to understand exactly what the best option is. They keep hearing uh, and seeing headlines that state that this new model is now topping the leaderboards or this new model beats GPT-40 at these particular metrics. And so there's just a lot of uh, overwhelming information when it comes to identifying which model to build on, especially when you're looking to build and scale out a production level uh, solution. You don't want to be making the wrong choice. And a very um, similar or related question to that is what model gives the best return on investment? Uh, last year, everybody was scrambling to just build, uh, to just, you know, learn about and experiment with this technology. And everything was more so like, let's build something on LLMs and see if it works. This year in 2024, executives are reining that in a little bit and saying, okay, what solutions will actually provide an ROI for our organization? So we're going to talk about cost, quality, uh, the importance of this competitive ecosystem, why I think it's important that we actually have all these models competing against one another, uh, what you can do about this, right, with uh, LLM distillation, and where I see the future of Gen AI solutions going. So let's dig in. What's the best model? If we had talked about this in May of 2024, just a few months ago, I think the universal consensus would have been OpenAI GPT-40. And then in June, everybody was abuzz about Claude 3.5, this powerful new model that was actually giving OpenAI a run for their money. July, Llama 3.1 was released. This is an open source model that was incredibly powerful. Um, fluent at multiple languages and giving the proprietary models a run for their money. And then just this month, we saw Google announce their, their Gemini 1.5 upgrades uh, that made it significantly cheaper. And uh, there's all this chatter about how it's really good with long context windows. So you can see just in the span of the last four months, how confusing this can be, right? Uh, there's, there's all these models and it's just not enough time to, there's not enough time to go in and test each and every single one of these. So we're going to go through a framework to kind of think through how to, uh, how to evaluate this. And just as a spoiler, there is no single best model. There's going to be different models that will serve different purposes, uh, and you have to find the right one that's, uh, that's perfect for your specific workflow there has been an explosion of model options, right? That is just in the last four months alone. There's a lot of players out there. And if you look at some of the Hugging Face leaderboards, there's 200 foundation models and counting. So I don't think this is going to stop anytime soon, but generally this is going to be good <clears throat> for the community because we're starting to see competition between these. We're starting to see kind of prices come down, uh, quality, it's not just overall quality, but quality under very specific lenses. 
Uh, and so I think this explosion of models, while overwhelming at first, will be good for the industry overall. It's also important to note that a year ago, nobody thought that any company could, could catch up to OpenAI. But we are um, starting to see, you know, people switching over to Cloud 3.5 and saying, hey, this is every bit as good, if not better, at specific use cases. We're also starting to see people compete on the <clears throat> SLM front, the small language models, where they say, okay, it may not have all the power of an open AI, but for this specific use case, where you have limited hardware capabilities or you have very specific narrow use cases, an SLM can perform better. Additional considerations, um, proprietary versus open source. This is a very important high level classification of models. So there are the proprietary players out there, right? The uh, <clears throat> Anthropics, the open AIs, the coheres of the world. And then there's a slew of open source models um, from companies that may surprise you like Apple, uh, uh, releasing open source SLMs uh, through to um, Llama 3.1, which is probably the premier one at this time. And so as we go through this row, <clears throat> I'll, I'll add a little more nuance because it's not as obvious as, you know, always choosing proprietary or always using open source. In terms of quality, proprietary is generally still considered to be better, right? If we just look universally, I think it's accepted at this time that Anthropic and OpenAI may have the best universal models. But open source is catching up very rapidly. Llama 3.1, I want to give a special shout out to because I don't think people saw that there would be this quick of a, of a gap closing from the open source models. And so uh, 3.1 in particular has been powerful enough to handle many of the use cases that we're seeing our clients test out. And I think that gap is going to close within the next 12 months. Price. You have to take a moment and think about what the business models are for uh, each of these providers. So, for example, if you're an open AI or you're an Anthropic, your business model is actually going to come from building and developing and selling these models. There's going to be a margin there. And <clears throat> indeed, if we look at the prices, <coughs> excuse me, if we look at the prices, proprietary tends to be higher in price. On the other hand, open source is generally much cheaper, right? There isn't that margin built in. You're not paying for some of these overhead costs. And so if you are able to go through the work, think about it kind of like um, in the old school days of like building a pre-built PC versus going out there and building your own and setting up your own, open source can be significantly cheaper. We're seeing um, 20 to 30 times cost savings for these open source models and the configurations you can set up. In terms of convenience, a lot of people start with proprietary because it is immediately there. They've tried to build, make this as easy to use. Um, you can get started you know, today uh, with one of these proprietary models. Whereas open source, some of them are available. You know, The llamas, the mistrels, you can probably find those immediately available via API, but others you'll need to set up your own server, install it and get it set up, right? Inference speed. There's a dependency here. It's going to be highly dependent on the provider that you choose. But for open source, you can configure and you can set that up yourself. So if you want to optimize for inference speed, if you want to buy the most powerful GPUs, you can get these running just as fast, if not faster than proprietary. Uh, but on the other hand, people are running these off of their own MacBook Pros at home, right? So it's up to you. Customizability. For proprietary, uh, it can be, uh, there's, you're limited to whatever the provider offers. Uh, they will offer certain hyperparameters to configure. Um, it's also prone to model drift. Let's say your provider is getting sued by some data provider, right? They may have to retrain their model. They may even be upgrading their model overnight, but because LLMs are such a black box, their upgrade may accidentally break the use case that you're relying on to work in production. If you follow the subreddits, uh, for some of these companies, they will often say, hey, did this model just get worse overnight because this was working all the last three months and suddenly it's no longer working. So this is called model drift. And it does put you at a little bit of a, it puts, it makes you greatly dependent uh, to the 
uh, whims of the provider itself. Whereas with open source, you know you are getting something solid, something that will not change for better or for worse until you choose to upgrade it. Security and compliance, again, it depends on the terms and services, the conditions that are laid out by the provider. Whereas with open source, you can set this up on your own hardware stack and, uh, and fully understand uh, the compliance and, and regulatory consequences end to end, right? So, you know, if you were to look at this table at a glance, it may feel like propri proprietary is the, the easiest way to go, but it really depends on the level of investment that you're ready to put in. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the best ROI, because as we dig further into this, the most important thing to talk about um, for convincing your board of directors, your executive uh, committee, is proving out that this solution is actually going to pay back on its investment. How do we measure ROI for an LLM? This is another common question that we get. Well, the thing is, we should talk about this with the same parameters we always have, right? What are the cost savings and what's the revenue generation potential for uh, the solution that you're thinking about? For example, if you use an LLM to automate parts of uh, writing a report and you know that a doctor can save 30 minutes a day on average in writing reports, that's a very a specific number that you can calculate and say, hey, we were able to save this many doctors 30 minutes a day at this rate per hour, that's how much it saved our company, right? On the other hand, there's really exciting fields about new pharmaceutical drug discovery. And so if you can say, look, we ran this for three months and we expect to have this many new drugs and it's going to generate this much in revenue for our company, that also has a very tangible ROI. So you have to, even as data scientists, um, you have to think about the business potential and the business applications here. On the other hand, what's the cost of implementing the solution? I'm going to talk through just the first level bullets here. You can either build or buy technology. Um, there's maintenance and operation costs as you deploy this. And then there's onboarding and training of your staff. That's the same as it's always been for any new technology, whether you are deciding on a new cloud provider, a cloud provider, whether you are deciding to use Snowflake versus, um, versus Databricks, you always have to consider the same costs. There's only a couple new things that you have to think about for LLMs that are a little bit more LLM centric, uh, which are the ones in italics here. There are unit costs to consider. For the first time in recent memory, there are actual unit costs to this software solution. Historically, once you built the code, once you distributed it, the whole magic of software was that there were zero unit costs and it was 100% margin. But suddenly with LLMs, companies are seeing their uh, Gen AI bills rack up to a hun hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. And there are certain types of use cases and situations where it no longer makes sense. Right. In fact, you have to compare the cost of how you currently do this. Right. For example, how much does it cost for a doctor to manually do this today with the unit cost of applying an LLM here? It may be um, it can actually if you're doing a multi uh, very complex workflow with chain LLMs, this can actually be more expensive uh, on a case by case basis. Right. The good news here is, as we'll talk later, unit costs are coming down. So as unit costs come down, it'll open up more and more use cases where this can be applicable. Uh, the difficulty of hiring Gen AI experts. Uh, this is relevant whether you're building or buying technology, but this is a technology that is only two years old, right? ChatGPT was only introduced to the world two years ago. So there's that meme about people trying to uh, hire, you know, data scientists with five years of experience in LLMs, that doesn't exist. The people who do have experience here uh, are very limited. So if you want to even purchase the technology, you might still need somebody on staff who understands the nuances of that. And particular if you're building, it can be very, very costly to hire people who can actually build and develop this technology in the correct manner. In terms of maintenance and operation, 
of course, there's always, you know, software updates and uh, how do we make sure to protect against downtime? All the usual considerations are there. But then on top of that, there's this buzzword that everyone talks about, which is hallucinations, right? And I think that this should just be considered under the general cost of maintenance and operations. Even traditional machine learning models or even traditional software, there will always be an error rate. So if we just rename hallucinations as error rates and expect that this software has a, has a certain level of errors ex to be expected, you can bake that into the cost, right? Software will have a certain uptime. It will always have, um, let's say you're searching on Expedia. There will be a certain amount of times that it misunderstands the name of a city, right? That is not so different than thinking about hallucinations. And if you just consider, um, hallucinations as part of the baked in error rate, that gives you the framework to identify what, um, how worthwhile it is for you. So if we look at this as a whole, um, in terms of the bigger picture, ROI is largely a similar equation as it's been for decades. Looking beyond just cost and accuracy, right? A lot of the previous slide was very focused on just, um, costs, financial costs, but what are the other parameters to this problem? Well, one would be timeline. When do you need this solution by? Uh, some of these technologies are still very early and maybe the solution that is right for you won't be available on their roadmap or requires further customization and may not be available for six to 12 months. Is that acceptable, right? Um, there's also security concerns. Uh, particularly if you're going to be sending to proprietary models, at least 50% of the Fortune 500 companies have enacted policies where you cannot send data, for example, to open AI. So if you are not allowed to send data to third party servers, then that leaves you with limited options. Now suddenly you're turning to open source. Uh, preferred cloud. This has, you know, there's been a long time battle between the big three, AWS, Azure, GCP. If all of your organization's uh, data is already in one of these clouds, then there is going to be a switching cost incurred, or maybe your organization has signed a long-term contract and actually can't switch, right? Uh, so you have to think about the convenience of those data integrations and where the data is currently stored. And you know, if let's say hypothetically, all your data is stored in GCP, does it really make sense for us to be using Azure-based LLMs or vice versa? Um, and finally, SLAs, right? Not only are there unit costs uh, to these LLMs, they can also take longer than we're used to software taking. So for example, um, when you're using ChatGPT, when you're using um, uh, one, of these, one of these LLMs, then it, the UI masks how long it truly takes. Because it does this clever like typing uh, style animation, uh, it feels like it's making rapid progress, but we're used to 20 years of Google delivering, you know, 100,000 results in 0. 0.0008 seconds. These models, on the other hand, are taking anywhere between two and 30 seconds. So that may make it un, uh, unacceptable for specific types of use cases. Think about a customer service bot where people are expecting answers in, you know, under five seconds, anything after five seconds, and you've already lost the customer. So you have to have SLA thresholds uh, in order to make this solution viable at all. And in particular, even individual calls can take a while. If you are now chaining multiple calls together, that takes multiplicatively more time. So I, I love these research papers that show just how powerful agentic workflows can be. But when it takes five back-to-back -back LLM chained calls in order to make it happen, then I start getting a little wary because now we're talking minutes. And are users going to be willing to wait for minutes for one of these solutions to come up with an answer? Let's talk a bit more about the importance of this com healthy competitive ecosystem. The good news is, all these providers are very aware of the competition and it's stoking a lot of uh, a, a lot of competition across all these dimensions so what was really interesting to me in july when openai announced gpt40 mini it was not about uh 
the incredible quality jump or the uh, performance improvements that we had seen from previous generations of uh, GPT announcements. This one focused very specifically on uh, pricing. OpenAI, I think, realized that a lot of its customers were getting sensitive to how expensive GPT-4 Turbo was costing, right? And so they specifically focused on how this can be significantly, again, 20 to 30 times cheaper than GPT-4 Turbo. And they were encouraging all of their customers to switch from 4 Turbo over to 4 O Mini. Again, with just this month from, uh, from a couple of weeks ago and Google Gemini, uh, the, a lot of the, the announcements were very focused in significant reduction in costs. So for all of us as practitioners, as these costs come down, this will unlock a whole set of use cases that just three months ago may not have made sense for our organization. So I actually think the um, broader set of, of Gen AI powered products that are out there will increase, right? In addition to costs coming down, we're also getting more powerful hardware and more and, and better optimization, right? And so we're also going to see SLAs and like the, the inference speed come down as well. And so that is also going to enable a whole set of products where speed was really critical to the performance of the overall solution. Now, all of this is just us taking it in, letting the industry come to us and just waiting for advancements that we could take advantage of. But there are also things that we as data scientists can proactively take the reins on and improve ourselves. So this is a project that my AI team has been working on recently that was really exciting. Um, it's a concept called LLM distillation. And if you've followed me on LinkedIn or um, in previous webinars, I've talked about this a lot, but this has gotten more exciting than ever. With LLM distillation, um, with LM distillation, we actually are taking a larger model. Uh, in this case, we're using the outputs from Llama 3.1 405B, and we are having uh, we're having excuse me, uh, we are having this model uh, produce results and training the smaller Llama 8 uh, 3.1 8B uh, model, right? And so here we take this open source data set from Hugging Face, where we have the inputs, uh, which is a question and some context, and we have an output. Now, we're going to use this to say, okay, um, let's see how 405B performs on this particular data set. Now, we took 1,000 queries. It's a small scale experiment. It's 1,000 queries. And what we were able to achieve was We'll just focus on accuracy, but you can see the, the supplemental numbers here. 405B alone was able to achieve 76% accuracy uh, with zero shot in this case, right? With no additional um, fine tuning, no customization whatsoever. On the other hand, 8B, as expected, performed considerably worse, only 67%. But after taking 1,000 examples from 405B, imperfect examples, mind you, just the 76% accuracy examples, we fed that into 8B for, with fine tuning, and we were actually able to get higher accuracy. This is using LoRa fine tuning. We were able to improve accuracy by an additional 4%. So now we're using a smaller model and getting better results. On top of that, because it is a smaller model, you can see here, this is the calculation uh, simulating 10,000 inferences now. 10,000 inferences using 405B because it's such a large, um, large model, it takes 14 hours. And the cost of that is just is, is $76, right? Whereas on the other hand, after fine tuning this Llama 38B model, we are able to get that down to 50% of the time to run and uh, shave off two thirds of the cost. And by the way, this is still not fully optimized. This is just using off the shelf solution, um, fine tuned with the 1000 parameters. We actually believe we can get this cost down to an order of magnitude lower than the original cost. So 
I think that LLM distillation is still not being discussed enough in the industry. And I think that these kinds of techniques are going to help us build solutions that are significantly more robust um, and shave off a lot of the additional overhead uh, that's unnecessary with these larger models. Um, just to summarize those results, we were able to achieve higher precision, recall F1 accuracy, um, F1 score and accuracy after just a thousand samples. Uh, we were able to reduce cost by three times um, while improving infant speed by at least 50% compared to that original model. Last bit here, let's talk a little bit about the future of Gen AI solutions. Uh, this whole time, we've been talking about solutions as kind of in the singular, right? Like having a singular best solution for your particular workflow. But I actually don't think that that's the way we're, that's the direction we're heading. This is entirely hypothetical, right? Um, but I would foresee, let's say we take a large organization like Starbucks. Starbucks is not going to decide that Llama 3.1 is the best model for all of their use cases and become a Llama 3.1 shop. I think instead, if you took all the Gen AI costs across the entire organization and added up their receipts, it would look something like this, where maybe uh, a good third of it is on OpenAI and Azure, right? Maybe they're using GCP for some of their longer context problems. They've used AWS for a certain set of solutions, and then they've built and used other homegrown solutions for another 30%. A large organization is not going to zero in on a single model, but rather have a, a set of different models used for different use cases. Um, I also think it's important to think about uh, whether LLMs, this is very much an MBA term, but are LLMs and Gen AI a sustaining innovation or a disruptive innovation? For each individual field, are we going to see existing players like the sales forces um, and the Slacks of the world and the, um, and the Microsoft Words of the world incorporate LLM solutions and continue to dominate the field? Or will we see new startups disrupt each of these product lines and build a Gen AI first solution that becomes the eventual leader? This is important to think about because as we break things down across org charts, again, this is hypothetical, I'm not saying that this is the way each organization should go. But as we look across different or, um, organizations within our own company, I think that certain organizations like HR, marketing and sales, they may look at all the solutions out there and say, hey, something off the shelf works for us. It's plug and play, it's good enough, and uh, it's much more cost effective than building our own from scratch. On the other hand, Maybe other um, organizations like accounting or your company's core secret sauce, they say it's not worth it. Uh, it's too sensitive. We don't want to rely on a third party solution. We have to build and develop our own. Again, this is not a new concept. We've done this with software for the last few decades, right? But every organization will come to their own conclusions. So we're going to see, you know, back to this slide about sustaining versus disruptive, we are going to see. Uh, different organizations come to their own conclusions, and we're going to see the ecosystem continue to evolve very rapidly over the next couple of years. All right, so let's summarize what we've covered during this um, webinar overall. What's the best model? There is no single best model for all projects and workloads. It's going to depend on the individual parameters and constraints for each particular workflow. What model gives the best return on investment? you have to come up with your own parameters and ROI calculations. Uh, you have to test multiple models to find the right fit. You have to match the right model to the right project depending on things like quality, speed, and cost. Um, future of Gen AI solutions, right? Uh, there's, there's going to be more specialization, which will accelerate the use of multiple models within organizations instead of aligning to one, uh, one size fits all. Um, I want to do a, a give a quick shout out here again to to Llama 3.1, right? Because not only as an open source model is it proving what open source the as a category category can achieve, but because of uh, its nature, it can also be deployed to on-prem um, 
servers. Uh, it also is the the um, is also using a lot of training data from very specific languages, right? So it's fluent in eight languages. Previous models have generally been trained on 95 plus percent English training data, whereas Llama 3.1 represents you know eight different languages. And so we're also going to see globalization of this technology. So, you know, at least for the moment, I give Llama 3.1 a lot of credit, but I think it's blazing a path for other models to follow suit. So I also think that we're going to see a lot more um, solutions that are now build buildable directly on-prem uh, and can be and can be multilingual uh, from the get-go. Okay. All right. That is it for today. Um, with that, I will take any questions that you might have.